It now gives me great pleasure to invite Mark Hounsel from AMIA to the stage. Mark knows what the judges have decided, and most importantly, he's carrying a check for $25,000. Please welcome Mr. Hounsel. I, uh, I actually don't know what the judges have decided. It's in a uh, sealed envelope here. So, uh, <laughs> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Il me fait grand plaisir d'être ici avec vous ce soir. C'est un honneur pour moi. Et uh, quelle soirée formidable que on a vécu ce soir. It is my honor to announce the winner of the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. As you heard earlier in Vince's video, if you were paying attention, at EMIA, we value authenticity, strong opinions, originality and passion, all of which are reflected in the nominated books. The finalist authors explore crucial political issues and share vital insights with Canadian readers. Three dedicated jurors selected these finalists after carefully reading books on politics published last year. The jurors, Denise Chong, Terry Glavin and Jane Tabor are, I believe, all here tonight. Maybe we can get them to stand up. Thank you. I was just about to say, please join me in recognizing them for their hard work and thoughtful deliberations, but you've done that, so thank you once again. Okay, time to get right to it and to announce the winner. The 2014 Shaughnessy Cohen Prize and a check for $25,000 goes to Joseph Heath, Enlightenment 2.0, Restoring Sanity to Our Politics, Our Economy and Our Lives, published by HarperCollins Publishers. Congratulations, Joseph. Um, thank, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, the, it occurred to me this might happen, but it didn't seem so probable. Uh, it's a f kind of an esoteric book, so I appreciate it very much. Um, bon, alors, j'aimerais commencer uh, avec uh, un petit uh, avertissement pour mes amis francophones. Um, C'est que certains de mes livres ont paru en français, mais ceux-ci, les droits de traduction sont encore disponibles. Alors, vous n'avez que contacter HarperCollins à Toronto, vous demandez Lisa. Elle sera tout à fait contente de vous euh, vendre ses droits. Um, les euh, remerciements vont aussi commencer en français parce que euh, je vais euh, remercier euh, l'équipe euh, à, à la revue Nouveau Projet euh, à Québec euh, et en particulier Jocelyn Maclure, c'est lui qui a commissionné, commissionné l'article sur lequel euh, le livre a été basé. Um, a couple other people I, that I'd like to thank. Um, first of all, uh, my, my friend Andrew Potter. We actually wrote a book together about 10 years ago called The Rebel Cell. And um, this was supposed to be sort of a follow-up to that, to that book. Was, so we started writing it together. Um, and I wrote some of it. And then he um, got called by the Ottawa Citizen and asked to be their managing editor. And then disappeared into a vortex of daily journalism from which he has not re-emerged. Um, <laughs> So I was left with a, a third of a book, and so I completed it by myself. Um, but Andrew had a, had, a, had a role to play in every, every aspect of the sketching out of the ideas. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank uh, Harper Collins as well, um, my editors, Jim Gifford, Doug Richmond, and also Iris Tupholm. Um, for, first of all, for their willingness to publish a 400-page book on the subject of reason. Um, <laughs> that is a hard sell. Um, and it, the, the reality of non-fiction publishing in this country is that you have to be prepared to lose some money on some titles to be able to do this kind of work. Um, my impression actually is that this book is not yet broken even, um, and so this may help a little bit. <laughs> but I really do want to offer sincere acknowledgement then to the press for their willingness to put this kind of work out. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, I'd like to thank the jury, both the decision, but also for the careful attention to all the books. Um, the other uh, four nominees, I want to say I had a chance to read the books in the last couple of months, and I enjoyed all of them. They're all dramatically different. Um, there is one small thing I wanted to comment, though, is that I kind of noticed that the books were a reflection of um, that the left in this country continues to be very, very good at, at writing, writing books, um, and perhaps not so good at winning elections. <laughs> So this, is, um, so this is an observation that people have been making for well over 20 years, that maybe we should take our giant brains and apply them to this question of how to win elections. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and so a lot of people have been coming along trying to offer advice on how we might do that, and a lot of the advice has all gone in the same direction, which is that you have to kind of copy the same tactics that are being used against you, that you have to fight fire with fire and so forth. Um, you know, there's this phrase, it's not about what you say, it's about how you make people feel, right? That's the kind of advice people are getting. Um, and my, this book arose out of a dissatisfaction with, with that advice and the consequences of following that advice, um, because it really does have a tendency to kind of reinforce a spiral that's been going on in our politics, that's created what many people call the post-truth political environment, where it's just all about how you make people feel and not about what you say. Um, and I think that's been very unhealthy for our, for our democracy. Um, so just to wrap it up, I just want to say that, um, you know, so when I, when I look at, at, at contemporary politics, I, I, so I am reminded, like many Canadians, um, of the uh, 2008 uh, NHL playoff series, and in particular a special game that occurred between the Rangers and the Devils, uh, when Sean Avery decided um, that he wanted to screen Martin Brodeur, and many of you will remember this. Um, so instead of screening him the usual way, which is putting his back to the goalie and sort of moving around, he just turned around and faced Brodeur directly in his face and started sticking his gloves and waving his stick around right in Brodeur's face. Um, and so uh, uh, the Devils complained, Brodeur complained, the referee looked at it and said, uh, there's nothing I can do. There's like, there's no rule that says you can't do that in hockey. Um, it hadn't occurred to anybody previously to do that, uh, so there wasn't a rule. Um, <clears throat> so Sean Avery kept doing it. All right. Um, now, I think this illustrates a number of things, uh, and I, I just want to suggest that, um, in particular, what it shows is that just because you're, you're not breaking the rules doesn't mean that the way that you're acting is not in some fundamental way hurting the game. Um, <clears throat> so I, I did have a little shout out to the author, so I just want to say one thing to... Um, to all the, uh, the political uh, operatives and elected officials in the room, is that uh, I just want to encourage you, this is really presumptuous, but I just want to encourage you every so often to look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I the Sean Avery of Canadian politics? <laughs> all right. Um, now, of course, the, the, the other nice thing about the Sean Avery story is the very next day the NHL made a new rule that said you can't do that. Um, and it's been immortalized now as the Sean Avery rule. Um, unfortunately, in, in politics, we don't have a benevolent NHL, right? It's up to the players to come up with the rules. Uh, and therein lies the difficulty. And therein lies the way in which we can get caught in a kind of a spiral, right? <laughs> <clears throat> And so as you can see, these problems are much more difficult to solve in the political arena than they are in hockey. So thank you to the Writers' Trust. Thank you to all. Have a good night. Kind of a, a Claire Underwood moment there. Um, <laughs> That was in chapter 30, chapter 33.